so you got one last thing between you and uh, beer, and that's me. <laughs> Good luck. All right. Um, so as Robbie covered, my name is Steve, and I work at a company called uh, SendGrid. If you have ever taken an Uber and got an email afterwards, we sent that email to you. If you've ever gone to a happy hour and then gone home and bid on eBay and then been thankful that you lost the, le the next morning, we sent you that email. Because sending one email, easy. Sending three billion emails on Black Friday, hard. Um, and so the, the kind of uh, cash cow of the business is sending emails. I work on this uh, product called Marketing Campaigns, which uh, is a big old React app. And, uh, which is like basically you go in there and you create, you use modern JavaScript frameworks to create HTML from 1995. <laughs> that works in Outlook 2003, um, which uses words rendering engine, not even IEs. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Ask me about conditional uh, comments that support IE later, and I'll cry. That'll be fun. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're gonna. This talk is about thinking about performance. If you came here hoping for some like magical bullet, uh, like oh, I'm gonna do this one weird trick, and then my app is gonna be faster. Like you're not gonna get that. Sorry, because if there was a one weird trick that they could put into your React app, they would have just put it into the framework, right? Uh, like this is going to be how to think about the performance of your application, how to tell what is slow about the application, what you might consider doing about it, and how to think about structuring an application so it's not slow in the first place. So. Chapter one uh, is going to be a short chapter. It's called, What is Performance and Why Does It Matter? Um, so we're going to talk about why performance matters. And originally, I, was going to, I had all these, I have like 20 slides with like factoids about how companies know they make more money if their app is faster. So you can go to your boss and like say, hey, give me like 10 Jira stories to like screw around and make my app faster because I saw this cool talk. Um, and then Robbie reminded me at the speaker dinner last night that I am the only thing between you and happy hour. And if I go over, I will have a room full of very angry people. So the slides are online. I tweeted them out. Uh, earlier today, and I'm going to skip all of those slides because I'm scared of you. Um, you can you can read those slides if you want, like the you know collateral to go in there. Like Amazon makes more money for every like 10 milliseconds they shave off the response time, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I also recommend reading uh, every year. Adi Asmani puts out the cost of JavaScript, which kind of goes in a lot of just what the amount of JavaScript we're shipping is doing. Um, to the experience on the web. So instead of enduring 20 slides where I cover all that, you now have homework. <laughs> See, I am a public school teacher, right? <laughs> all right. Um, on brand. On brand. Uh, all right, so we're going to think about performance a little bit. And how I think about performance, building a large client-side application, and how you might think about it depending on where you work might be very different. You look at the New York Times, for instance, versus Gmail. We're willing to tolerate a loading bar in Gmail because we open it once, it's running all day, we're in it, we're doing our thing. If every like, thought piece on the New York Times had a loading bar, we'd be out of there real fast. Right, you know, we'd see our like our manager coming from around the corner. You switch those tabs, you get back to Jira. It's all good. Um, and so the kind of performance I care a lot more about, um, kind of whether or not I have a memory leak, how fast the page is updating. I don't like I care about time to first meaningful paint, but if I can paint the email editor and they can't use it yet, I don't really care. Right? And so there's a different set of priorities I might have for a full-fledged web app than if you have a content site that you might care about. And that's totally cool. You need to think about what is best for your application. Start there. Um, like I, the, the gains I would get out of server-side rendering are not nearly as big. So there's kind of three kinds of performance, which is kind of the network performance, like getting that application from whatever CDN or data center it's in uh, to the browser, right? Getting, you're just traveling over, over the wires to the client device. There is the time to kind of parse and figure out. We send code that goes to the browser, V8 or um, SpiderMonkey or, what is it, WebKit? No, it's not WebKit. What is it, JavaScript Core? That's the other one. Um, go ahead and like they parse it and they build the entire page and they go through all of it, right? And then we actually have to paint it to the page. So these are all different kinds of performance. And again, the application you work on is going to have different needs. That's why we're giving this talk. Because again, if there was a silver bullet, it'd be in the framework. 
The important thing to do is don't be that person that goes in there and just starts applying performance optimizations willy-nilly. Right? We're going to see today that some performance optimizations can slow your application down if you're not careful. So before you do anything, we're going to talk a little bit about measuring. And you should measure before you do anything. You should measure as you're doing stuff. You should measure after you do stuff. You should just measure a lot before you start just applying stuff. You don't know if you're helping or making the problem worse until you have a benchmark. Um, cool. So again, kind of just kind of close out that point. We care a lot about um, figuring out what our site needs. What it, for whatever app you work on, what is the kind of thing that actually drives uh, your user happiness for your application? Right? Figuring out what that core thing, right? For me, it might be time to get to the point where you can edit an email. Right? For you, it might be very, something very different. So measure. Don't get carried away with measuring, because the more you measure, the more you can actually slow your app down. Right? You throw a bunch of console logs in there with performance.now, that is going to slow your application down. Right? So the act of measuring can also slow things down. That's fun, right? This is great. Uh, <laughs> this is a nice, light, easy talk for the end of the day. Um, and that thinking, the point I'm going to make at the end of this talk is that thinking about the architecture application can actually be better than applying performance optimizations all over the place. <coughs> Throughout this talk, we're going to have three different tiers of advice. Definitely do this. Maybe do this, but measure before and after. And only do this if you find a performance problem that desperately needs solving. Right? So not all of these should you just go. At the very end, we're just going to like do a, like, a very fast pass to a bunch of Babel plugins that may or may not make your app faster. Like, those fall under, probably don't do this, unless you can actually like, measure it and justify it. Stuff like putting React in production mode, which we'll see in a second, yeah, you should be doing that. Cool. And also thinking about what are you sacrificing? Are you sacrificing readability? Are you sacrificing reliability in the name of performance? If you can't get a feature out, like that two milliseconds you shaved off the initial load time, maybe not the best investment in the world. So here's some disclaimers. Uh, React is decently fast out of the box. Being all crazy about performance at the expense of creating value to customers is not particularly awesome and not going to win you any like, accolades uh, amongst the product team at your company. Um, and we're going to look at some contrived examples. One, because showing you a large code base at this like, resolution is not going to work. I would get fired, and you wouldn't understand it. So that kind of like cocktail of different things is probably good enough reason to look at some dumb examples. But first and foremost, we are going to talk about my golden rule of performance. Uh, this is not tied specifically to React performance. This is all performance on computers and in general, just all, the all over the place. Doing less stuff takes less time. Better than doing something faster is just not doing it, right? <laughs> if you don't do it, it's very fast. Um, and that is kind of the running theme, is we're going to see how much stuff we can possibly not do in our applications or in life, right? This is all like a, there's a meta point here that I want you to get. Cool. So what could we not do? Like, maybe we don't reconcile the virtual DOM if we don't have to, right? Um, don't keep your state flat and primitive. That is a do. Uh, <laughs> I got carried away. Um, don't add function calls to the calls like you do need to, and do share things. So don't make bespoke things as you go along. I should have just kept on a solid don't thing, and then we would have been better off. Chapter two, who hurt you? Um, React 16 uh, gives, like, React 15 earlier had um, the React perf tools, which are really cool. Um, and they don't work anymore, so whatever. Uh, React 16 lets you use web standards to measure the performance of your application. Um, using this, this new API that is supported in most browsers um, called the User Timing API. The User Timing API lets you pull up the dev tools and actually have different frameworks or your own code put markers in there. So you can see, like, OK, we're going to start measuring here. We're going to stop here. You'll actually get that along with the other flame graphs in the dev tools, which is super cool. Um, in order to support that in React, you need React 16 or higher. You need source maps, and you need developer tools. How do you turn it on? You add this query param. What browsers can you use it in? Glad you asked. If you are doing most of your development in Opera Mini or the BlackBerry browser, <laughs> I am sorry. Also, how? <laughs> Please tell me more about this after I've had a beer. 
Um, and so you can see that if we have that, you know, um, question mark react underscore perf there, we get new things that React can kind of put in there saying, okay, I'm going to start reconciling the tree. And like, since Jen told us all that is, we know what that means now. Um, we'll make the application component, so on and so forth. It'll show us every component, rendering, mounting, all the stuff that it's doing on top of just the general vanilla, like JavaScript is running, um, which is really cool because it lets us see where the pain is. Um, one of the cool things you can see over in in the hold on, lower right corner is that kind of red triangle that I hovered over um, on that upper right corner of the event thing. That's like Chrome will mark anything that take, it feels like took too long. Right? So you can like run a recording and you can go ahead and see what Chrome thinks took way longer than it should have. And that's really the first place that you should go look before you start adding like perf things that you learned in a Medium post all over the place. <laughs> Figure out where it's slow. I love that I blamed Medium Post instead of me. Um, the other thing you can do if you have the React Dev Tools there is you can go ahead, go ahead and do highlight updates. And what this will do is every time a component is being reconciled, like Chrome has one built in to say when it changes the DOM, you'll get that like purple flash. Uh, this will put a green rectangle around anything that's trying to reconcile. So if I went ahead and hit one of these forgive or unforgive, this is a list of everyone who's wronged me, by the way. Um, that's very long. Um, Forget, like, there's no delete. You don't forget. You just forgive and perhaps unforgive, depending on the situation. Um, if I hit one of those buttons and the entire thing flashed green, I have a problem that needs solving, right? Because reconciling the whole tree when I'm trying to change a button, that's doing a lot of stuff. And doing less stuff is faster than doing stuff. All right. So now we know how to figure out the pain. Um, let's go ahead and tr like, try to solve it. One, just before you do anything, uh, make sure that you are in production mode. Right? You're like, I'm always in production mode. Um, yeah. Production mode just takes stuff out of React. We're not doing prop types. We're not doing helpful warnings. Uh, we're not even going to do the performance stuff in there. We're not going to have the console logs yelling at you about keys and stuff like that. Because not doing those things is faster than doing them. And the way you can tell if you have the React tools uh, is if it is orange and scary, you're in development mode. If it is black and like the regular React logo, you're in happy mode. You say, like, I know I'm in production mode. Let me tell you how many times I've gone to production in my own app, saw it was in development, had to put it back into to production mode and, because someone tweaked the Webpack config. <laughs> mm. um, also, when I did my expense report today. Um, <laughs> I don't know where everyone works. I'm not going to name names. Uh, all right, now we're in production mode. Good. How do you do this? If you're using Webpack, you just as long as the uh, node environment, you know, like, I write front end code. Just bear with me here. Uh, the node environment is production. You're in production mode. That's it. Somehow, I have somehow screwed this up multiple times. <laughs> what makes React fast? Uh, Jen talked a little bit about this. Is changing the DOM is very slow, right? The browser is like, I don't know if this new div is five times larger than the old one. Let me recalculate everything. That is doing stuff. That takes time. Um, and so if you do, you know, like, well-meaning, you go in there and do a bunch of little changes to the DOM, right? You could actually be like causing all of these reflows and repaints all over the place, and you don't even know. Um, so the virtual DOM basically, let's do this over in this in-memory object. We're not changing the DOM. Let me see what you did. Okay, I got an algorithm that's going to do the bare minimum here to make it work. Um, and then it goes ahead and does that. Like you'll occasionally see some thought piece from like um, you know some very super famous engineers where they go in there. We wrote our custom vanilla JavaScript one faster than um, than React can do it. Cool. You have no junior engineers in your team. That's neat. Um, <laughs> like you spent a lot of time to make a point. Um, we have to make money with our applications so we keep our jobs and our stock options are worth something. Um, so it's basically a most of the time good enough, like very good algorithm, better than most of us would do without trying, that works really well. Could you hand tweak it and do it better? Yeah, you could. You could also write assembly. <laughs> I'm not angry. Um, React's reconciliation process basically it calls the render function on everything in order to see if the, like, the rendered output has changed based on the props. You know it's faster than calling render on every function? Not calling render. Um, so yeah, not checking the component tree is faster than checking it. Um, one way that we can do that is we can kind of bypass the ability to render by using should component update. 
which is every time the props change, every time the state change, this method is called on a React component, and it basically tries to find out, um, should I even bother calling the render function? If we can skip calling the render function, then yeah, right? Like, that's faster. Right, and so here's a cool uh, diagram from the React docs, which is if the virtual DOM is equal in a kind of parent node, it doesn't go down the tree anymore. And if you say should component update, if that comes out false somehow, it also stops checking the tree. So if you can, st like, if you have a big enough application, this tree is much bigger than this, right? And you can go ahead and try to figure out how you can like not check large swaths of the tree. That is going to be way faster. So th this is the default behavior, which is yeah. I should update, and it will go ahead and check, because like, React doesn't know what you want. I wish. Um, so it's like, yeah, I'm just going to check, and I'm going to figure out everything and be cool. This will make your application a static web page that never changes. Uh, you shouldn't have shipped React. You could have just written HTML at this point. Um, right? And somewhere in the middle is the sweet spot. Right? So we had a user avatar, and we're passing in an entire user object. And I'm going to argue later, just don't do this. It's easier. Uh, we can say only if the avatar property of that user object has changed, should we try to re-render this at all, right? Uh, and that will solve some of that. I'm going to leave this tweet on the screen for a second. One, because no React talk is complete without quoting Dan Evanroff to make your point. Uh, this is how we solve all React debates internal in SendGrid, uh, is we just throw Dan quotes at each other until somebody <laughs> like runs out of them and that person loses. Um, and then we make our tech choices based on that. Uh, so I'm going to throw this out here. I'm going to let it wash over you for a second. Cool. Uh, pure components seem really cool. All they are is if you did this all over the place, right? It's a shallow comparison, right? Just looking at the top level, look, look at these two objects. Is the, the current props the same as the next props? Is the current state the same objects as the next state? Don't render, right? And so you could do that. You can inherit from or extend um, pure component. Either one is fine. If you're all fancy and on React 16.6 already, uh, you can actually do that with functional components as well with react.memo. So you're like, yeah, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put should component update everywhere. Um, so here's an application where we're going to go ahead. We'll do some filtering. This, uh, this resolution is working great for me. Um, and this is with no should component update. You, so you can see we're re-rendering all those data roles in the user timer API. That seems cool. This is if I put should component update in every single function now. Yay. You can see there's a whole other tier there, because we're calling should component update, and it's 200 milliseconds slower. right? Because calling should component update every single time is more work than not calling it. <laughs> right? So when you got really happy and took your very first performance optimization a little bit too far, you slowed down your app. Great. Not my fault. I warned you. Um, cool. So. That's our first kind of lesson of why we need to measure first. So we took the very first performance optimization and managed to slow down our app. We're killing it right now. Here's a fun one you probably can't mess up, which is uh, when the reconciler goes in there, you might be adding a row to a table, removing a row from the table. Right? It wants to figure out, it doesn't want to replace that entire table or that entire list. What it wants to do is to figure out, did they just shift around? I can just move them around. Is it just one put at the bottom? That's super fast. Right? But it doesn't know that unless you give a unique identifier to each thing in that list. So Putting those keys in there, we just like try to ignore that warning. Sometimes we do some really, really dark stuff, like <laughs> using the index of an array. I know who you are. Um, or we misspell random, and it blows up the entire thing, which is good, because your app should blow up if you do that anyway, because you're mean. Uh, but by giving you a, um, a unique index allows React to figure out if we just put them on the top, we just sort and it lets that algorithm work better. So that's why it's yelling at you about that. So don't, just, just do what you need to do and don't be lazy. All right, that's a definitely do. All right, here's my kind of soapbox, which is how you architect the state of your application. I think for a lot of points, like even Jen made this point in the last talk, of uh, components, yay, right? I think the tricky part for most user interface applications, from jQuery applications that we built like 10 years ago to React applications we built today, is managing state. Right? We used to manage, we used to jam it all in the DOM and figure it out later. Now we store it in a giant Redux store, whatever. Um, and like 
thinking a lot, I don't think as a whole that we spend enough time thinking about how we manage state. And I think you can solve a lot of problems for yourself by thinking deeply about this. Um, cool, and that's exactly what I just said. Uh, prefer primitives. Uh, so generally speaking, Primitives are strings and numbers and booleans. They're all passed by value. We'll talk about what this means in a second. Objects, including arrays and functions, because those are objects too, are passed by reference. So this means 1 equals 1, A equals A, true equals true, and also 1 sometimes. Um, but these two objects are not the same, because they are different memory addresses. right? Um, these two arrays are not the same. These two functions are not the same. So if, for instance, like you set state, it's going to be like, oh, this is a totally different thing, and it's going to re-render everything. And doing that work is slower. So if you keep your data flat, you can kind of get more to using these primitives and not have to do a whole bunch of weird nesting. So for instance, we can have some posts, um, first and second, and I want to go ahead and like, change you know, just the description of one. Well, that object is still the same in memory. So I can start to do stuff with a, if I had a bigger object and I want to change just the body of a response to a comment to a post. Cool, I just set state. <laughs> yeah, anytime your JavaScript looks like a triangle, you're messing it up. <laughs> um, if I keep it flat and I just keep references to each one, I can actually just change just that response and not have to go all the way down. All right. I can also use a library to do that for me. We're now in like rapid fire mode here because I'm breaking the rule of not getting you to happy hour. Um, six, minutes. six minutes, fine. That's fine. I'm only on slide 72 of 126. Um, this is, if you ever use something like Mongo, this allows you to find a schema and it will take the big thing that your backend team gave you that is a bunch of nested objects and make it a flat object for you. Yay. Because not doing stuff as a development thing is faster than doing stuff. Um, there's some really great talks. You would not be like, unwise from watching some talks from backend engineers on how to structure a NoSQL database, because it's not that much different. Cool. Breaking up your containers, you might be like, hey, I'm going to make a post list container. I'm going to pass it all of the posts. That seems really cool, um, except that if any post changes in there, we're going to re-render the entire list and all the subcomponents. That takes more time than just rendering the one that changed. So here I might just pass in the list of IDs, have the post singular container take the ID, and hook that up to state. Now I can change just a single post, and now I have to re-render the entire list. Um, the other one is to memoize your containers. If in Redux or anything along those lines, I give it effectively the same array, don't even run map safe to props, because doing that takes longer than not doing it. Uh, libraries like reselect will help you with this. Um, some fun fact about selectors, they basically, if they see effectively the same array or the same arguments being passed in, they just use the last time they calculated that value. It's basically caching, right? Which now skips an entire set of steps and again, not doing the stuff faster than doing it. Uh, speaking of not doing stuff, shipping less code is helpful. Um, most of the time in our applications, like backend engineers especially, like, hey, are you gzipping everything? Uh, that's cool. That's not where the hurt is in my application. That little slice of blue is the time spent loading it, and that big yellow slug along the top is the time spent parsing and compiling the JavaScript. Right? So like, getting it there a, lot, a little bit faster is not going to save my users a lot of the pain. Um, Cool. So if you ship less code, it takes less time to parse and compile. Um, you can lazy load and preload with React and Webpack. Um, so you know, a review of the, not doing stuff is faster than doing stuff, and doing stuff later is better than doing it now. You know, I have a very large application. They might not need the contact upload code if they're going to the editor. Right? They don't need that, so I shouldn't ship it. I shouldn't make the browser parse it. Um, if you are not doing code splitting, this is the first and foremost thing you can do to speed up the load time of your application. I'm going to show you how. Uh, so we, have, we ship a lot of different bundles. right? We slowly and progressively load more code as we need it. And loading code, like not loading that code up front means we can parse it faster because we're parsing less of it. Um, and you see all of our tiny little bundles. It's really great and wonderful. Um, so you can do that with suspense right now by calling a component lazy. The real magic is in that import statement up there. Uh, Webpack will basically asynchronously load that code, and it will break it off into its own JavaScript file and load it as needed. Uh, so this is how you do it in suspense. If you're using something earlier than React 16.6, you can use React Loadable, which is really cool, which is like, hey, here's the component I eventually want. Here's a loader you can show in the meantime, and it will asynchronously load that code for you. 
Uh, this is kind of tangentially related. This is React Lazy Load. If, you, if you've ever seen it on like Medium, you won't see the images until they scroll into the viewport. This will allow you to do it. It basically detects when that image is going to go into the viewport and only loads it then. Right? This is more of a layout and rendering performance rather than a parse performance thing, but we'll take what we can get. Cool. Uh, libraries like Lodash, you can do like Lodash slash map, and you won't get all of Lodash. Not parsing that code faster than parsing it. All right, final chapter. Chapter six, let, using the build tools to do the hard work for you. Silver rule of performance is you not doing stuff is faster than you doing stuff. Um, Babel has some cool tools that you can kind of take a look at. Uh, one is um, that just removes all the prop types from your production build, because not parsing that code faster than parsing it. Here it is before, here it is after. Um, you can even remove the imports and get even less code, and that is faster because you're doing less work. Um, cool. You can also begin to like wrap stuff, so on and so forth, if you need it for some kind of debugging. Um, you can tr you know, transform React Pure class to a function, which is if you're just doing this, because we all start with a functional component, then we have to refactor, and then we have to do all this anyway. It's annoying. And it'll actually do this at build time, so you send less code. Uh, the component has state. It doesn't do anything. Same thing. There's the one transaction. <laughs> transition. Um, very cool. Um, this allows you to write class components. If you want to add in the should component update and stuff like that, you can do it. But you don't have to, and it doesn't affect your production code. Um, another one is this one will actually take the stuff like the H1 that is never going to change here and the footer that is never going to change and hoist them so they're not even being called in render. We do it outside. They're, they're already in closure scope. We don't actually run that code anymore. Not running code faster than running code. Um, Prepack is another way to do this. You shouldn't use this one. It's really beta, but it's kind of cool, right? And what it'll basically, instead of running a loop, it'll just make the thing for you. <laughs> Um, but in this case, it becomes really cool, which is we've got a Fibonacci function. And you can see what it compiles it down to. <laughs> All right, conclusion. One minute and 42 seconds over. Um, uh, when testing performance, think about are you using a $3,000 MacBook Pro? Looking at all of you. Um, you can, Chrome has tools to put it in like slower modes, like real people modes. Um, are you simulating less than perfect network conditions? Yeah, and you're fancy, like imagine you're on conference Wi-Fi all the time. Um, and set a performance budget. What is our current performance? What is the, un like at what point are we going to not accept a pull request if it slows our app down past our performance budget? Or what are our goals? And starting with that rather than, I'm gonna just make it faster. Like how about maybe just not make it slower? Right. Start there um, and kind of get that in place. So in review, uh, build for production, profile before you do any of this stuff because you could make it slower. Um, don't do stuff if you don't have to do. Prefer primitives, keep your state lean and mean, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh